morning, everybody. Welcome back to our webinar series. And uh, we'd like to tell you thank you for signing up today. We have a really interesting program. Um, I also would like to tell everybody that we are happy to be back with our live events. We're going to be back at Gallupis on May 5th. And that is in Pompano for those of you that have joined us before. So everybody's really excited about that. It'll be a little different. We will not be having buffets. We're gonna have seated breakfast, but um, please, for those of you that have been there, they're doing their best to keep us COVID safe. And while people are um, being vaccinated and the numbers are going down, our medical people and our um, legal people all feel that it's time that we can go back as long as we're acting safely. So we're excited about that. So um, any of you that have been there before know it's a lot of fun, please join us. Um, we're also gonna be back in West Palm Beach, which is up by the airport, West Palm Beach Airport. And uh, the same for that. We have a big room with a lot of separation and people will still be asked to do the right COVID thing. So if you've been there before, watch for our announcements. They come from our great Jeff over here, who's in charge of all things mechanical and noticing of everybody. So we're excited about that. And uh, right now we're really excited about WRG and getting you all the information. Many of you have heard Robert at Gallupis and he always goes over really well, but this is an opportunity to be a little more personalized with him. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and we'll talk to anybody about questions about our live events a little later. And you can see them all posted at our great website at TSK Marketing. So go there for information. We're trying to keep it as updated as possible. Jeff, all yours. Thank you, Terry. And uh, before we get started as well, uh, with, with a few questions we, we, we received ahead of time. I'm a New Yorker. I talk quickly sometimes, I gotta slow down. Uh, I want to turn it over to Monica Martinez from the Water Restoration Group, and Monica is the sales manager. So uh, Monica is one of your primary points of contact, and she would like to say a few words before we get started. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Monica Martinez from the Water Restoration Group. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, just to give you a little background, we're uh, we've been in the industry for more than 15 years. And the services we provide is water restoration. In the event you have a leak at the property, uh, we do as well fire restoration, mold remediation, and of course, asbestos abatement. 95% of our business comes directly from uh, high rises. That's what, we, that's what we specialize in. So we're here to help in anything you need. And we service the Tri-County area. So Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade. We also have a preferred client program. If uh, any of you as an association or board members are interested on getting more information about it, uh, there's many benefits to it that we can discuss after, but you can reach out to us, you know, calling our office or through our website. Thank you again, everyone for being here and Jeff, back to you. Thank you very much. And I see we also have John uh, has joined us before we get to a couple of questions. John, uh, just briefly, uh, your role with the company in case uh, anybody sees your handsome face? My role with the company is to go out and stay in front of uh, uh, the property managers, our, our clients or potential clients, and to uh, let you guys know that we're here if you need us, when you need us, and also uh, uh, if we do have the opportunity to perform services at your property to be act as the liaison between you and our production team to make sure everything goes smoothly and uh, we keep the, all the, the uh, stress and uh, cost to a minimization and to uh, make sure everything goes well. So feel free to reach out to me and um, I look forward to seeing you uh, in the future. Thank you very Thank much, John. Thank you very much. And now we're going to move on to our instructor for today. And Robert, if I butcher any of your the crate. I mean, you have, it's a laundry list here, a whole list of all these things you're certified with. So Robert Lozano, Vice President of Environmental Services. Is that, did I get that correct? I hope. Uh, an environment, Vice President of, of, yes, the Environmental uh, Services of uh, the Water Restoration Group. So. Fantastic. And certified with asbestos, mold, and COVID. Is that, do I have that correct as well? 
That is correct. We do perform the trifecta of cleaning. Um, we can also perform lead-based paint removal, which is a whole nother beast, a whole other animal that we're not gonna get into at this moment. Um, but yes, uh, environmental services is what we do. Uh, so that's awesome stuff. And I, and I know you guys are come highly recommended. I've worked with you in the past and uh, you, you definitely will not be making a mistake by giving a water restoration group a chance. And uh, again, as Terry mentioned, their information is available not only on their own website, but on tskmarketing.com. You can reach any one of our folks here today. Uh, Robert, before we get started with the CE program, we had a few questions that were sent in ahead of time that I just want to get to real quick. One of them is, what is the process once you find out that there is a presence of asbestos in areas that are going to be impacted at the property, at the association? Very good question, Jeff. Uh, generally, after uh, a material has been identified to contain asbestos, uh, we clearly defined what needs to be removed. Um, the next procedure is obviously after signed contracts and an agreement. Uh, that would help. <laughs> the important stuff too. Uh, we meet with the owners. Uh, we put a game plan together to see what phases uh, they want done, um, how it's going to impact the facility. And then we notify the county. Um, they are an important aspect. We are a regulated industry, so we have to notify the counties, give them uh, advance notice, uh, sometimes as far as a uh, 14 uh, calendar days notice before we can start an asbestos abatement project. And once that's done, the clock starts ticking. We will arrive, uh, perform the uh, the abatement work uh, as per we uh, had designed it with the owner and building engineer and with the county's blessing. Um, after the abatement has been completed, there's post removal air testing. When that's completed, we tear down our containment, remove the hazards and turn the building over to the uh, client so that the next phase of construction or renovation can begin. Well, you mentioned county and a light bulb just went off in my head. Uh, are there fines involved? What if the asbestos is not removed? Is there a timetable, anything like that that can get the association in hot water? Uh, good question. Um, yes, you know, the, the reason for this class is because there's been a lack of awareness in regards to asbestos. Okay. And due to COVID and budget cuts, the counties have been um, lean when it comes to uh, personnel, um, but they are ramping it up because uh, construction has been booming. and. Uh, and the first persons uh, that they are retaining are enforcement, the enforcement division. And they're instructing them to go out into the fields, uh, do dumpster diving, uh, come across projects where they have construction, or they could stumble across it by looking at uh, another type of engineering uh, permit inspection and asbestos be discovered being removed improperly while, while they're adjacent to the area. And yes, the counties, um, the reality of it is it is a revenue stream for them. They aren't looking for professionals like ourselves who are doing the work properly. They're looking for the ones who aren't doing it properly. And again, not trying to scare anybody, but the fines is, is an absolute reality. Not only does it stop production, uh, owners get fined, um, contractors get fined, and it's really, really a mess. And again, the purpose of this class was to educate people on how to avoid that because it is completely avoidable. No doubt. And, and I'm, uh, I'm looking at some of these other questions and I have a strong feeling they're gonna be covered in the course. So I'm gonna skip a lot of them, but uh, one more here that actually is, is quite intriguing to me. Who's responsible, you know, as dangerous as it could be with the fines and, and this process you spoke about, whose responsibility is it to tell me if my facility even has asbestos? Like what are they, how do they get started? That's another good question. And it's also, uh, I'm not gonna call it a slippery slope, but when it comes to environmental hazards, everybody's pointing fingers at each other. Hmm. And this industry has actually been around uh, since 1984. And so a lot of these uh, things have been thought out. Um, there are federal regulations, there are county regulations, there are state regulations, and a building facility is required to know if their building contains asbestos in, is in it or not. So the primary responsibility falls upon the, the facility owner. And if there's a condo board, well, then that covers under their umbrella. Um, one of the tragic things that we find is, and again, the importance of conducting this class is that building owners are not aware that their buildings have asbestos, whereas there are legal documents that are probably enclosed in that phone book of, of paperwork that you're signing either when you're buying a unit, renting a unit, or, 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 or involving other business activities. Right. Um, there's verbiage in there that states that, hey, your building may contain asbestos. We have actually asked building owners 
to first identify whether the buildings have asbestos, have an idea of where it's at, and then produce a brightly colored piece of paper that go in all contract documents and say, listen, your building or your unit may contain asbestos. Hmm. And that's really the first step. So it's it's kind of like you don't know you broke a rule until you broke it. And we're trying to let people know that, hey, there's rules out there. Please follow them so that you can avoid this, this, this a potentially uh, expensive and time consuming situation. And throw COVID into the mix. It's just, it comes to a grinding halt. And well, we're not a country that stands still. We are not. And you mentioned COVID as I'm coughing into my arm. I promise it's just allergies. Anyway. Um, Robert, before we get started, I really don't think I'm going to touch upon these other few questions because I they're going to be covered in the presentation. <laughs> I, love, I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, one day, this stuff might be transmissible through the computer. I hope we don't get to that point. Oh, my God. But before we get started, I want to mention, too, that in the most recent reminder email that everybody got to remind you to come to this webinar, at the bottom was a link to uh, download and view the slides that Robert will use today. For those of you who did not yet do that, right now, if you go into the chat window, like I said, you can chat, but we can send messages to everybody listening. I'm putting the link for the presentation in there right now. So if you haven't already done so, you can go in there, click on it, and follow along with Robert. And with that said, Robert, uh, screen sharing abilities are enabled. The floor is yours. I'm going to hide my face and on with the course. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Jeff. All right. Uh, let me get this thing rocking and rolling. Boop. Boop. Where am I not screen sharing? Hold on, Jeff. Technical difficulties. No worries there. We got There we go. Is that it? Yes, sir. Uh, just start it and we're good to go. Awesome. 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 Let me minimize this thing. Again, thank you everybody for attending about this class. Uh, Jeff, Terry, you guys are awesome and I really do appreciate you uh, uh, in participating and, and, and navigating and guiding this thing through. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Robert Lozano, Florida licensed asbestos contractor and asbestos. Why is it being mentioned now? And as I had mentioned earlier that we've been noticing a lot of, lot of uh, missteps and mistakes that have been occurring. And whereas you all may have heard about asbestos mesothelioma um, on those late night commercials, along with those bubbly alcoholic beverages, um, we realized that there was a lack of knowledge and awareness. And asbestos is quite prevalent, uh, not only here in South Florida, but throughout the United States. Oh, there we go. So how does it impact you as a, as a CAM, as a property manager, as a condo association? Well, first and foremost, asbestos is a federally regulated material. Uh, we are governed by a whole alphabet soup of legal entities that, that control the industry, um, monitor that it's being done properly, um, uh, disposed of properly, uh, that, and people are protected. Now, there are, as a, Jeff and I had spoke earlier, there are harsh financial consequences if handled uh, improperly or if ignored. Um, recently, we just came to a facility where we went into a boiler room and I was just, I shouldn't say surprised, but appalled as to the lack of maintenance and the amount of asbestos that was falling out of this building. And it's those situations um, where should a county official uh, come in, uh, the contractor gets fined, an owner gets fined, uh, the association gets fined, management companies, the counties really, when they see a violation, just cast a wide net over everybody. And then they let everybody else figure it out. But I do wanna stress first and foremost about this class. This is not here to, to cause fear or to cause panic because it's kind of like a magic trick. Once you know how it works, there shouldn't be any fear. But what I am asking to, to do is please respect it. Um, I've been doing this well for over 30 uh, years. Um, I do protect myself. Um, I do ensure that our technicians are properly protected and again it's about respecting it knowing how it works um, just like the first responders that are handling with covid if they know how to take care of themselves and to protect themselves first then from there they know how to service the community this is probably one of the most common things that we encounter um, on an asbestos job and and the one thing that we are trying to avoid to uh, 
start that cascading effect of the, of the, of the counties being involved, fines being implemented, projects being started uh, or, or projects being delayed. The job usually starts off as something relatively small and minor. Um, and we always talk about the removing of wallpaper. Um, the first thing that people want to do uh, or, or now is renovations, an older building, they wanna make some improvements to it. And you know, wallpaper is kitschy, it's not popular anymore. So they wanna go ahead and get that removed. And sure enough, and, and it's common in most uh, facilities that have wallpaper, when you remove the wallpaper, there's mold. Well, for whatever reason in the industry, and there's changes coming to that, and the counties are definitely taking notice, but people are addressing the mold issue and not addressing that there could be a potential asbestos issue, as asbestos was used quite, li quite liberally for many, many years. But after the wallpaper is removed, they'll come across some drywall, they'll notice some mold, so they'll just cut out the mold. Then they say, well, you know what, we've got cottage cheese holes, or Swiss cheese holes all throughout this facility. Let's go ahead and remove the carpet and let's remove the ceiling tiles and let's maybe we found floor tile in the lobbies that were initially installed and covered because that was unsightly at the time. And all of this and people not realizing that any and all of these materials can contain asbestos. The wallpaper, the wallpaper glue, the sheetrock, the drywall joint compound. And we recently came across a facility where this is where it started. And the contractor didn't need permits for any of this type of work. It was really just architectural finish type works. But however, he was disturbing the material. So county got involved, shut the project down. And it, and I, it was just recently settled maybe a year and a half ago, but it was just a nightmare of projects. But again, it just started off something so small. And generally that's how um, a dam flood occurs. It starts off with a small leak. And then before you know it, a dam has burst. Well, asbestos, what is it? Um, a lot of people think that it's a, it's a, it's mold or it's a, you know, it's in a Chinese drywall. No, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Asbestos is actually a mineral and it, it's been mined from the earth on an industrial scale for hundreds, if not thousands of years. The most common producers of asbestos um, during the time of of installing it into building components was the United States, Canada, Africa, Russia. It was used extensively in World War II, um, post-World War II uh, um, construction and building. Quite a bit of it was used there. Um, it has been known since the times of antiquity when uh, people paused long enough from looking at the stars to looking at shiny objects on the ground. Um, it was discovered that asbestos had this wonderful properties to it. Um, Pliny the Elder had mentioned it, and this is going back thousands of years ago. Uh, it has been used extensively in the United States since the 1700s. And if any of you guys are history buffs, um, you'll know that the United States experienced an industrial revolution from the 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s. So it was used quite everywhere. And why was it so popular? It was a wonderful fireproofing material. Steel will actually melt at a lower temperature than asbestos. They found out it was a wonderful insulating material. If it was something was hot, it kept it hot. If it was cold, it kept it cold. And most importantly, it was very, very chemical resistance. So at the time, it truly was known as the miracle mineral. Many, many different components can contain asbestos. And just even after my illustrious career, I did manage to find that bowling balls had asbestos. There was a brake company who had dust that was generated from asbestos like you would in your uh, wood collection devices and they were selling it to uh, bowling ball companies and uh, there was actually a lawsuit where people were drilling holes for the finger holes and they had contracted asbestos so even after all these years of doing business it still surprises me the amount of things where asbestos can be found now out of all these 3,000 components where asbestos can be found there's maybe a couple hundred that are found in our industry of residential, commercial, or, or, or schools. But most buildings before 1985 uh, will contain asbestos. And whereas people consider asbestos a hazardous material, it is legally and technically not a hazardous material. It is a regulated material, which means that the government keeps a regulation on it. They wanna know from cradle to grave, where did it come from? Where was it being used? And how did it make it to the landfill? 
And asbestos, being the wonderful mineral that it is, was broken down into two categories, friable and non-friable. And what is the difference between the two? Well, friable is anything that can be crumbled by hand pressure. Ceiling tile, you can render it into powder with your hands. Uh, popcorn ceiling, you can render it into powder with your hands. Drywall. Well, drywall is not considered a friable material, which means you have to sand it or abrade it in order to get that, those, those fine asbestos fibers out. And whereas it is a regulated material, it can actually still be found in today's new building components. Now, the United States, as it regulates asbestos materials, you will not find asbestos materials in US made markets. However, we are a global trade industry. We do import a lot of products from all around the world. And there are countries that still use asbestos. Now, they got a little bit marketing savvy. You're not going to flip a product around and say asbestos in it. It may say minerals or silicates or, or some other name, but it won't mention asbestos. But those materials can be found in asbestos. And whereas buildings built before 1985, there's a strong, strong likelihood that it contains asbestos, the counties... Uh, and the state government does require an asbestos survey for all buildings, regardless of the age, because you can still find asbestos product in today's uh, components. Now, it, it, it isn't very common, but it does enter, enter our construction stream. So to be on the safe side, the county has enacted everything. Unless you have a letter from an architect stating that this building is certified to be asbestos free, and of all my years of experience, I have yet to find an architect who's gonna put his name on that because there's always that chance that asbestos could be introduced into the construction stream. But again, we find it most commonly before 1985. I've probably done a dozen buildings afterwards because it being introduced into new building products after the, 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 the ban of 1985. It's a mineral, it's a rock. And if any of you ever want to come and see this thing live in person, I do have some. Um, one of those geeky science guys that likes to collect minerals. I consider myself a rock hound. Uh, there are six species of asbestos, and I do manage to collect all of them. So it is a really interesting, fascinating thing, but it is a mineral, and um, they just process it uh, to and install it into the desired products. It's a hole in the ground. Um, there's actual veins that run along with asbestos, uh, that uh, asbestos veins, um, and it's in between rocks that don't contain asbestos, so they have to crunch it up and pulverize it. The United States does not have any active mines. Uh, the most recent mine that closed was one in Canada, out of a town famously known as Asbestos, Canada. Um, I'm sure if you guys uh, paid attention to the news and watched asbestos, um, they're actually uh, recently changing the name of the town to um, something more palatable because the unfortunately the negative name with asbestos has uh, hurt the industry and they want to offer tourism but they don't want to always be associated with asbestos. What are the health effects of asbestos? Now this is where it gets down to the meat and potatoes. Why are we removing this? What makes it so um, dangerous and why is there the alarm to deal with it properly? It is a known fact that asbestos is a carcinogen and when rendered into that friable fine powder, it does break down into microscopic fibers. <clears throat> and during the mining, during the World War II, during the construction, um, a lot of contractors didn't take the necessary precautions to protect themselves from dust. Uh, I believe it was up until the 70s where they started introducing commercials for mechanics to stop blowing the drum and discs as the brake pads contained asbestos. But what they also found is that if you smoked and you worked with asbestos, you increase your chances of getting cancer enormously. Um, I believe the number is in the 90% range. And um, if some of you are within the age category that I'm not, um, you will, the smoking was a quite popular thing. And I've seen many That's video true. footages of guys installing asbestos, cutting asbestos pipes, with a cigarette dangling from their mouth. And unfortunately, those two uh, was, was, a, was a dangerous okay, mix. Uh, asbestos does cause lung cancer. Um, it does cause asbestosis. It is a res respirable uh, disease. And the most common one that we hear about is the mesothelioma in those late night commercials. Um, and, and why did mesothelioma get uh, 
all of the attention because it is definitely the most lethal. If you have mesothelioma um, from the time of exposure to the time of uh, passing away is generally less than two years. And from all the research I've done, I only recall maybe three or four people that have ever survived mesothelioma. So um, those late night commercials, whereas they are drawing attention to the mesothelioma, that is the worst of the worst of the hazards. Um, however, lung cancer and asbestosis are still not pleasurable things to deal with. Um, with asbestos, there is a latency period. And what that means is from the time of exposure to the time of contracting an asbestos related disease could be anywhere from 10 to 40 years. And sometimes I'll get that phone call, hey, I had a contractor remove the popcorn in my uh, apartment and it, we found out afterwards it has asbestos. What do we do? Should I get an attorney? And truth be told, there really isn't much that you can do right at this point. If you were to go out and reach an attorney, they would obviously take your money as a retainage. And upon seeing a doctor, they would only recommend that you monitor it. So the suggestion would be maybe every year, take annual x-rays, take annual respiratory uh, uh, breathing uh, capacity to, to ensure that it's not progressively getting worse, but you won't see any symptoms for 10 or 40 years. So unless you wanna pay a retainage to an attorney for that period of time, it's really just a waiting game. And asbestos at one time did have the, uh, the connotation and name, not only just from being a miracle mineral, but a ticking time bomb because there's been evidences of exposure happening once and people contracting an asbestos related disease. And there have been people that have worked in the industry for months, days, years. There really was uh, no direct cause or the duration to the effect. There is no minimal limit of exposure that may contract an asbestos related disease. So again, this is not about being fearful. It's about respecting it and keeping it at, at its distance. And hopefully, as we learned with COVID, six feet is good, 25 feet is better when it comes to asbestos that has been disturbed. What does asbestos do and how does it affect me? I'm going to jump to one more slide because this may have a much more impact of how asbestos fibers can affect your health. That large tube that you are seeing is a human hair. And those little tiny pieces are asbestos fibers that can be broken down. And it's those tiny fibers that can be inhaled. And ironically, those fibers can even be broken down smaller than this picture right here. Um, it gets to the point where they actually need a transmission electron microscope is which they use to look at atoms um, to identify asbestos material. So the asbestos can be broken down into such a tremendous powder. And that's why there is such great concern with the counties and the entities and the authoritative figures regarding asbestos, because once disturbed, it's the dust that gets you. It's the asbestos fibers that, that cause the health concerns. And they're just so tiny and so airborne and can be floated, it does cause those uh, terrible health effects. And where it, whereas this slide is showing mesothelioma, it's the same principle for asbestosis and lung cancer. Your body has a wonderful protective mechanism to protect itself from foreign objects, whether it be mold, dust, pollen, and larger asbestos fibers. And when those fibers are inhaled, your body will, through nasal hairs and through the cilia in the back of your throat, will prevent asbestos from entering your lungs. But asbestos fibers being so tiny will bypass those areas and they will get embedded into the lungs. And the body being a wonderful piece of machinery that it is, will send out, um, your body will recognize, hey, this is a foreign object. We've got to do something about this. They will send white blood cells after it to remove this foreign body that's within your lungs. Well, since asbestos is non-digestible, impervious to chemicals, the body cannot digest it, nor can it remove it from the body. So the next best thing that these uh, the body's defense mechanism does is uh, create white blood cells and create a scarring tissue over it to protect further irritation and to protect it from getting worse. But unfortunately, well, fortunately, as we breathe, um, your lungs expand and contract. And every time those lungs expand and contract, those asbestos fibers actually act as spears and they continue embedding into the lungs. And your body will continue fighting this foreign object with more and more white blood cells. And in the simplest of terms, 
Cancer is caused by the excessive uh, production of white blood cells. But where does this mesothelioma thing come into play? Well, meso you have what's called a mesothelial lining, which is like a saran wrap around your lungs. And scientists to this day, even after all the research, are not quite sure whether those asbestos fibers penetrate the lungs into this mesothelial lining or if the asbestos fibers are transferred via the blood circulated and attaches to, to the mesothelial tissue. Well, that's a very, very sensitive part of your body. It does not adapt too well with asbestos fibers and it definitely doesn't adapt too well with a, with a, with a surge of white blood cells. So it will continue to irritate, it'll continue to amplify and your body unfortunately will just eventually shut down and stop because of cancer being produced. So let's take a moment and really look at this picture. Sometimes I'm still dazzled by how small, small these asbestos fibers are. And you know, mold spores are, are much la larger. I believe they're in the 20 to 30 micron size, if not larger. So asbestos fibers are much, much smaller than mold. So when we go into these projects and people say, oh, I have mold, I'm concerned about that. The real hazard is the asbestos. So this is definitely something to, to keep on the radar and to be aware of. Asbestos was so popular, they put it in cigarettes. As I had mentioned earlier, smoking was a really uh, popular thing during the 50s and 60s. It was uh, quite common to see it in cigarettes. I mean, to see it on uh, TV shows, on movies, to see it advertised on uh, commercials. But because cigarette manufacturers were so popular, they were trying to distinguish themselves from everybody else. And Kent was one of those cigarettes that they used it in the actual filter. And doctors were endorsing this type of uh, cigarette as a healthier alternative. And uh, not to be a Debbie Downer, but I have uh, an associate of mine who passed away about two years ago of lung cancer. And this was his mother's favorite brand. So whereas this gentleman did not uh, and was not a smoker, the secondhand smoke affected him. And um, unfortunately, tragic story. And, um, you know, I, I've actually seen it personally, and it's not a pleasant thing. Um, but I'm sure you guys want to know, where can it be found? I mean, you're talking about all of these buildings that may have asbestos, uh, or all these products that may contain asbestos, Robert, where is it? Well, we find it in roofing felts and roofing shingles, uh, blown in insulation, we find it in the backing of incandescent lights or hot lights or, or uh, halogen lights, bright lights. Uh, we see it a lot in um, movie theaters where they have those bright lights shining that spotlight on you and, and it, it, that asbestos paper at the back of it acts as an insulator from, from melting the metal behind it. Uh, they put it in the electrical cords. Anything that would be hot or cold, they actually used it in asbestos. And if any of you... Uh, followed my LinkedIn page, um, I was recently discovered that in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, in that very, very famous uh, snow scene as uh, Dorothy and the scarecrow and the lion were prancing through the poppy fields and it began to snow and it woke her up from her slumber. They actually used 100% asbestos as artificial snow. Um, they've used it in artificial fireplace logs, acoustical ceiling tiles. Um, we see it a lot in Palm Beach on the second story floors uh, they will have a, a paper, uh, almost like a roofing paper, as a sound barrier, as a dampening barrier, and they put asbestos tiles on top of that. We find it in pipe insulation, boiler insulation, behind main electrical panels. We find it in doors. We find it in um, gaskets. Uh, Monica and I recently went to a boiler room, and we discovered asbestos around the boiler um, where they take the end caps off. Um, so it's quite common in those areas. Uh, Stucco, uh, exterior stucco, interior stucco, uh, textured ceilings, asbestos popcorn ceilings, uh, carpet glues, uh, baseboard glues, uh, drywalls, window putties, floor tiles, linoleum sheeting. Boy, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So this is just 24, 25 items that we may find just in a common facility, but there could be many more. And going back to the asbestos testing, um, we're not allowed to test for the asbestos. We can always recommend somebody, but the government really requires a, it's considered a conflict of interest. So if you're going to have a renovation or a demolition of a facility, 
these testing firms are going to go out and check for materials that they suspect to contain asbestos. They're not going to take a picture, uh, a piece of, of glass. They're not going to take a, a piece of steel. They're not going to take a piece of wood. Those components don't contain asbestos and we're not manufactured to do it or with it, but a lot of other products uh, do. And again, one of the importances of having an asbestos survey, because if it doesn't contain asbestos, we have nothing to do with it. There's been times where we would be called into uh, after a survey has been conducted and it turns out, well, just that one pipe contains asbestos. The rest of these were identified as not. So our focus is just what contains asbestos. And that helps deal with uh, keeping costs down and only identifying the areas that need to be removed. If it doesn't contain asbestos, we're really not interested in it. It was so common, they even put it in fabrics. Uh, clothing, baby's clothing, which was a, a real interesting thing. Uh, movie curtains. Uh, I can go down to Miami Beach and I know of a dozen buildings that still have the movie curtains. And as these buildings are going through these 40 year recertifications, 40 and 50 year recertifications, um, they have to install fire sprinklers and bring things up to code. Well, the fire departments have asked in the meantime, leave those asbestos curtains in place because should there be a fire in that area, um, it's very difficult to get water to the back of a condo uh, building uh, over by the water and the firemen are, are aware that these curtains can contain asbestos. So they will actually use it to help contain a fire because it will stop the burning. Again, textiles. Um, a lot of people have that concept. Well, I only know that this particular size of tiles contain asbestos. That is an untrue statement. Um, the size of the tile is really irrelevant. Um, nine by nines, are most certainly likely to contain asbestos, but we also discover them to not contain. 12 by 12 floor tiles. I've had many people tell me, hey, that's 12 by 12s. It doesn't contain asbestos. There's really no way to visibly see a component that contains asbestos unless it is sampled. So the government and entities that govern us um, have the statement of, unless you prove that it does not contain asbestos, you must assume that it does. Um, the glues that hold it together, uh, the black glues, uh, we've seen it in brown glues, we've seen it in carpet glues. And to the right was a facility of where an owner did not disclose to a contractor that the facility contained asbestos, floor tiles. The contractor did not ask the question and he removed almost 14,000 square feet of floor tile that contained asbestos. And we had to go in and not only complete the balance of it, but also remove the black uh, mastic or adhesive, or for some of you old timers, the cutback, uh, which did contain asbestos. And when we're done, there's just nothing there. So all that material must be removed and it must be contained and it must be handled properly. This is a nice little condo down on Bayshore Drive in a hallway. And again, these are 12 by 12 tiles. The manager uh, who was in the building for 15 years was adamant that they did not contain asbestos, but because we had to notify the county, the county will not issue or would not endorse our 10 day notification unless they have a current survey verifying whether that material does or does not contain asbestos. And sure enough, that material did contain asbestos. So what I found recently is that there's uh, building maintenance guys who have been in facilities for a long time and they're telling the new property manager, oh, that, that area does not contain asbestos. That doesn't fly in our industry. Unless it comes from a certified testing company who sent it to a certified lab, your building engineer who's been there for 30 years cannot positively identify asbestos just by being in a building for a long time or just thinking, I don't think it has it. Um, as an environmental expert, I couldn't tell you whether that material has asbestos or not until it's sampled. What we encounter sometimes, there's actually three ways of dealing with asbestos materials. There's complete removal, there's encapsulation, which is applying a, tape, a paint type coating to it, and the third would be called enclosure. And this is a medical facility that had an asbestos textured ceiling on a plaster, on plaster, and the owner elected at that time to not have it removed, but he did have installed a ceiling tile. So there's many, many times where asbestos could be hidden. And that's why it's the importance of having 
a survey done because they will investigate farther. Um, and technically and legally, those tiles cannot be removed unless the person has been uh, properly trained. And a lot of uh, property managers aren't aware that their building uh, and facility managers actually need to be asbestos trained. I believe uh, it's a two hour course and it's an awareness course and it teaches them to recognize what may potentially have asbestos and how to deal with very, very small areas in the course of their activities, but they cannot remove it. They cannot, they may be able to patch a small amount, but um, even removing ceiling tiles, they would need to be in appropriate respiratory protection. So again, asbestos can be discovered and is quite commonly discovered underneath uh, other building components. And sometimes those other building components may not contain asbestos, but because the asbestos may have fallen on top of it, um, those two items may be contaminated. I know I get asked the question all the time, why is asbestos so expensive? Because on a situation like this, all of that ceiling tile would need to be removed as asbestos because it was in poor shape and it fell on top of the non-asbestos non containing ceiling tiles and cross-contaminated it. So there's a lot of material generated uh, in the asbestos disposal and removal process. Mechanical rooms. Uh, we're seeing quite a bit of mechanical upgrades lately, uh, putting in new um, boilers because of, 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 of they want it to be green, to, to be more uh, efficient, um, more cost saving. And in this particular uh, area, this mechanical room that was being done, it did have a boiler, but it was discovered that the ceiling contained an asbestos fireproofing. And these are exceptionally difficult to deal with. Uh, as this is uh, partly an electrical room and we have to use water when we remove asbestos. So again, when we do a facility like this, we, it, it's definitely tested to make sure it has asbestos. We definitely um, notify the county and we actually have to let them know our process for the removal of this asbestos in this unique area. So there is a lot of professional expertise. There is a lot of cross-referencing with other trades. Is there electrical involved? Is there a uh, the fire suppression system going to be involved? Can we shut down the uh, hot generator while we're removing asbestos materials? It really is a proper, proper planning is what achieves a properly removed project. And to think that, uh, you know, a contractor can come in and just remove that in two days is a fallacy. It, it, there's a lot of plastic involved. There's planning involved. In order to do it right the first time, it needs to be engineered properly. Um, this is something we also quite, uh, quite frequently is the duct mastic. And it's actually not the aluminum foil that contains the asbestos. It's the seams where they sealed it with a black tar type material. Um, when we remove this type of material, we actually remove it all. It's very, it's not cost effective to just try to separate the black insulation from the fiberglass insulation. Uh, so we only, we, we remove the entire component. Now to the lower left of that, because that has not been insulated with asbestos, we leave it alone. Now an owner may elect, you know, hey WRG, we want that removed while you're in the facility, but I wouldn't know in the future what their plans are. Are they planning on reusing it? it and because it doesn't contain asbestos, it doesn't have to be removed. They may have their, their new HVAC contractor remove it because it's a non-asbestos material. We are what's considered at the spear point. We remove the asbestos, and after that's been done, any and all trades can come after us. So we do take that into strong consideration when we remove our materials, who's coming in after us, and what will they be impacting. Sometimes people think that, oh, color. Color is irrelevant to asbestos. Uh, on the right uh, is a brown paper with a black mastic. Um, so it could be aluminum foil, it could be brown paper, um, I've seen corrugated uh, materials around it, um, but there's also the discovery of not knowing what else asbestos may be found. And to the left is an example of a hospital that we did where we had removed the insulation that appeared almost identical to what we're seeing on the right frame. And as we removed it, the discovery was that the mastic actually on the ducts was red, red denoting fire protection, danger, so it was a suspect material and where it was not in our contract to remove the HVAC ducts, being part of the team of putting this project together, we knew that they were eventually going to be removed. 
So as the material was discovered, it was sampled, it was determined to contain asbestos, it was put on us as a change order to remove the materials. So there was some fancy footwork where the HVAC contractor had to give a credit back to give back to us so that we could remove the asbestos properly. But again, with asbestos, it could be found even after removing a component. And I know this is a terrible word to use and most uh, CAMs, building managers, contractors, loathe to hear the word change order. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's a reality in our industry. We can uncover something and find more. And my answer, and I know it may not offer too much comfort to, to clients, but I have to remind them that we didn't put it there. It was there when we got there. We just happened to discover it. So uh, a prudent thing to do is if you do when you do call in a professional like ourselves to assist you in managing and preparing for a project, we will remind you to put a little bit of contingency aside just in case we have to utilize those funds because we may discover materials. Now, the inherent dangers of dealing with this stuff, if you look at the frame on the right, I'm um, excuse me, on the left, those caution signs are denoting live sprinkler heads. And this was in a hospital in a neonatal intensive care unit. And these ducts were built industrial grade. And we had to be so careful to remove them because one broken sprinkler can ruin everyone's day. So it's not something that's done quickly. It's done appropriately and taken into consideration the many dangers that are around us to not create a larger problem than what we're dealing with at the moment pipe insulation. This is something that we find common in um, residential homes, commercial office buildings, hot water heater pipes, and the asbestos insulation over time will deteriorate. And this is exactly how we encountered this particular project. Um, it was a commercial facility that was being sold and as part of the sale, it was required to disclose whether the building had asbestos. Somebody read that little paragraph that says your building may contain asbestos. So as part of the sales transaction, the seller got an asbestos survey and it was discovered that these pipes within the attic crawl space area did contain asbestos. So the buyer would not proceed with the purchase of the building until all the asbestos materials that were in poor shape were identified and removed. Now, there were some other materials that were identified to contain asbestos within this facility. They were in great shape. Um, they both, a buyer and seller agreed that, all right, it's in good shape. We don't have to do much with it. But I believe part of the negotiation was they allowed some funds for in the future should something need to be done. So it is sometimes comes part of the uh, negotiation aspect. But again, it's really common to come across asbestos and find it in terrible, poor shape. And not only could something like this affect a construction, but it could also affect a sale of a, of a facility. Fire doors. Uh, this, was a, this was a former hospital that we did in Miami. Uh, we had an asbestos survey. Um, the owner was kind enough to allow the Miami Police Department and the U.S. Coast Guard do training within the facility. And one of the things that they were doing were applying explosive to doors and blowing them up. Um, we happened to arrive the second day after their first day of training and noticed that there were doors being blown open all over the place. And we brought it to their attention that these fire doors contained asbestos, please stop immediately. And uh, they were wise enough to listen to our attention. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they actually went back and reported it to their local union. And uh, I can assure you the owner um, whereas it was a nice gesture to allow uh, law enforcement to go in and practice in his facilities, it will not happen a second time that he will make sure that uh, to know whether to pass the information on regarding asbestos in his building. So again, these are little missteps that could happen. It is definitely important to know whether your facility contains asbestos because once you do, then it does become your responsibility to advise the next person coming in, hey, whatever you're doing may impact asbestos. We do a lot of condo units. Um, lately during the 40 year and 50 year recertifications, we're removing asbestos in the hallways. Well, if we can find asbestos within the hallways of a facility, we more than likely can find it within the units of a facility. 
And keep in mind, the common areas are generally handled by the condo association and the interior of the units is the owner's responsibility. This may come as a shock to you guys, and you probably want to stay as far away from asbestos as possible, but there are thousands and thousands of miles of water pipes here in South Florida that is providing your drinking water that runs through asbestos pipes. And as I'm sure if you, if you watch the news, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami is constantly having water main breaks. Whereas it's a wonderful material and it can last a very long time, the world shifts, um, pressures are applied, pipes break, they wanna reinstall new lines. And um, we go in uh, after the excavation has occurred um, and we dispose of the pipes properly. Uh, sometimes we'll have contractors call us and say, hey, I got a big pile of asbestos, what do I do with it? So as to the frame on the right, um, or a county inspector will come in and say, hey, those are asbestos pipe, what are you guys doing? So we'll approach a facility uh, with 50 to 100 asbestos pipes laying on the ground and we have to secure it, control it, contain it and properly dispose of it. Where else can you find asbestos? Well, on the exterior buildings, uh, I'm sure in some of these older homes, I know I see them quite a bit around here in South Florida. If it's got those panels, they're really, really tiny uh, or thin asbestos cement panels. Um, this facility on the upper left frame, um, they were gonna demolish it. Um, so this facility had an asbestos survey uh, in order for the demolition permit to be issued, we had to properly remove it. Um, and so the asbestos was gone. Uh, to the frame to the right was asbestos mastic that was also discovered at the, at a hospital that we had performed. And they were going to make improvements to the facility and they were going to put in larger exhaust fans. And it was discovered that the waterproofing membrane that was applied to the walls contained asbestos. So we had to build a containment, remove all the asbestos. They did not want the balance of it removed. They only wanted enough and a little bit more additional so that they could install a new fan. There's a common misconception that if a building has asbestos, it must be removed. That is not a true statement. If asbestos can remain in a facility, provided it's in good shape, has not been disturbed, and um, is not scheduled for removal. So if it falls into those three categories, asbestos can be left alone. And which is a right that the ho this hospital facility exercised. We only wanna take out what we need, but we will document that this area contains asbestos for in the event in the future, we need to do improvements. We will know that it's there. Asbestos is very important when it comes to documentation. We provide documentation to the uh, facility owners or for individuals that we do asbestos for. Unfortunately, a lot of times it gets put in a binder and shoved somewhere. It is required to have an O&M program, which goes to that first question, how do I know my building has asbestos? Well, you're required to have an O&M program, which means you're supposed to know where the asbestos is and keep document documentation of where these materials are located and where they've been removed. It's a lot easier to go to that book and thumb through the pages and say, ah, this area has already been abated because we already have documentation showing. Or yes, we removed asbestos, but we only removed this half of the wall. Only this half needs to be done. Good documentation definitely facilitates and makes things easier. Um, to the lower left uh, is also a cement material. It's that corrugated material that's uh, on that soffit area. I'm really hoping that at the end of this class that this is a, what's called a Baron Meinhof effect, that if you hear something enough, you start seeing it everywhere. It's kind of like a, the Volkswagen Beetle. You know, once you see one and you start seeing the commercials, you start seeing them everywhere. Well, take a look at the world around you and you'll start noticing that there's more asbestos present um, than you would have thought. And again, these corrugated materials uh, do contain asbestos. This facility is scheduled to be demoed, so that material will need to be removed and uh, properly disposed of. When we find asbestos, what do we got to do with it? <clears throat> well, we have to install containments. We have to install decontamination chambers. We have to install appropriate signage to keep people away from us. Unfortunately, in our industry, we're considered an attractive nuisance. As soon as you put up a do not enter sign, 
this area contains asbestos, there's two types of people, those that run from it and those that run like a moth to a light bulb to it because of their inherent curiosity. And we always have to be vigilant to keep people out of our work area. We do expand our boundaries a little bit more so that um, you know you keep your distance. Um, we just don't, it, it, it's, it's happened on more than one occasion where people just wanna know what it is and they will breach our containment, go into the work area. And I know more than once in my illustrious career, I found people walking around containments just in awe and amazement of this fascinating thing that is occurring. So after a violent struggle, we throw them out. Um, but we do install a lot of plastic. Uh, we do contain the areas. Uh, we do have to use what's called negative air. We do have to use HEPA machines. So it is a well-controlled, well-regulated work area. You could actually, we could actually be doing abatement in one office and right next door, we could have people working adjacent to it. Because we're monitored and controlled and we do get site visits from the county, um, we do have air testing that does occur while we're doing our work. It's really, really regulated and it's actually quite safe to be on the other side of the area. Um, sometimes we come across where owners don't want people around them to know that abatement is going on. We understand that. But we also have to comply with the law and have to let people know this is a hard boundary. You cannot come into this area. And sometimes by mentioning, hey, we are doing a specific removal, you're well taken care of protective, you'll be fine as long as you don't come into our work area. Uh, we do try to avoid panic um, and it's okay to talk about this. Um, again, we wanna remove the fear from it and we do wanna bring the education and knowledge to it and to see how it works. Because once you understand it, it's an understandable process. This is one of those facilities of where it all began. And this one picture exhibits the entire reason why we are here, the education of a misstep. And this is that facility where a contractor went in, removed the wallpaper, cut out drywall, scraped the popcorn ceiling. And this picture is before we got to the facility or before we started our work. Um, and before the county got involved, I just so happened to be visiting another area, went up there and saw this and oh, be still my beating heart. Um, we tried to let them know, hey, this is not cool, you know, and unfortunately, I was viewed as a, uh, as a fear monger and that ah, it's not really a big deal. Uh, but it wasn't me that called the county. It was another tenant who had experience with it in another facility. They called the county. The project was shut down uh, because we were doing other work in other areas, we went in and completely abated it. But this was an absolutely unavoidable event. And probably for six weeks, there was finger pointing between the contractor, the condo association, the property manager of why weren't we made aware? And which is why the county says, not my circus, not my monkeys, y'all get a fine. And what they in, ended up eventually doing and how they settled the fine is they put it into a percentage category. All right, the building owner was responsible for 75% for not telling us the property manager was 15% and the contractor was 10% because all parties should have known that their facility contained asbestos. It's really sad, but the industry has gotten away from bringing awareness to it. People just wanted to hide it and not talk about it because one, it's too expensive or two, they don't want to create mass hysteria and panic. But the violations and the health concerns are much greater than talking about it. So again, the purpose of this is to educate and teach to avoid this simple misstep and, and lack of communication and lack of information. What is the one key source that we have to do when it comes with asbestos? There's no special chemical. There's no biocide. There's water. We keep it wet. Um, and it's akin to broom sweeping a driveway. You broom sweep it, you can generate dust. But if you hose it down and wet it, you will keep that dust down. That is probably one of the single largest violations that the county uh, applies apart from improperly removing asbestos is removing asbestos dry because that is one of the simplest techniques to minimizing asbestos exposure. Now, we don't go in there as firemen. We're not trying to hose down the building. We're not trying to saturate the floors we actually just missed the air. And if, it, if an airless sprayer without water is not within our containment, we could potentially get a fine. If the county does an inspection and they don't see it 
adequately wet, which is a broad definition, but it has to be wet, uh, we can actually get a fine. So there's a lot of rules and regulations that we have to abide by when um, removing asbestos. What does it take to remove asbestos? Um, not only apart from building containments, installing decontamination chambers, installing the appropriate equipment, it's a physical labor job. Um, we are in suits, we're in respirators, the ACE air conditioning units are shut off. Um, the, we're doing it in the middle of summer because a lot of uh, construction happens when the children are not within the facilities and they wanna take time when there's uh, minimal traffic in the buildings and it's physical, hard, hot, laborious work. So as right now we're experiencing a construction boom, if any of you guys are interested in a secondhand job and leave your old one behind, not only will you learn a new field, lose some weight, but it'll enhance your physique. So uh, we're always looking for good, competent people who uh, are looking for an industry uh, career change. But we do uh, pick up the floor tile, we do bag it up. Uh, it has to be double bagged. Um, all that material is removed. And then we proceed with the glue removal or the adhesive removal and all of that is removed. Then an inspection occurs. And once the inspection occurs, testing occurs. Once it passes the testing, we can tear down our containments and give it to the next trade. Um, the frame to the left was that one particular building where they had scraped the popcorn ceiling because it was not completed properly. We had to go in and remove the material properly. And there were pipes that the inspector actually, as required by the county, had to use a black glove treatment. A white glove treatment was for another trade. But the reason for the black glove is because they would wipe surfaces. And if there was any white residue on it, it was considered dirty and we had to clean it even more. And we were actually down to using Q-tips to cleaning areas because the potential of violation and because the county was involved, they wanted an absolute extreme level of cleanliness and we achieved it. Wasn't easy. We definitely disrupted tenants that were on the floor and we apologized profusely, but it was a necessary evil. Um, again, the frame on the right, uh, we deal with some very difficult construction conditions and in removing insulation. We have pipes, we have uh, sprinkler systems, we have fire alarms, we have live electrical. Um, we are constantly having safety meetings with our technicians um, because every job is distinctively different. And we take pride in walking the facility, familiarizing ourselves with it, know the hazards more than just the asbestos, but know the hazards of what we can encounter, are there holes on the floor, are there trips hazards, is there a live electrical box, don't keep this wet. Um, and, and fortunately, knock on wood, we've never had any major in injuries whatsoever because a well thought out project is a well executed project. What does it look like when we're done? Unfortunately, we don't have the liberty as a uh, carpenter, as a sculptor, as a painter to say, look at this beautiful thing I created. In our world, there's nothing there. It's visibly gone. So uh, the frames on the left, you would see we, we had removed some drywall uh, sheetrock with an asbestos joint compound. There was some floor tiles. There was some adhesive. It was removed in its entirety. On the right was a popcorn ceiling that we had done in a condominium. Um, the popcorn was removed, and we left a bare concrete deck. And the beauty of what it is when we're done and it should be required from your contractor should you choose not to use it, but we know that's not gonna be the case. You want closeout documentation. You want paperwork that shows that there was a licensed contractor performing the work. They're writing a closeout letter stating that they removed the asbestos materials, um, that it was handled properly, it was disposed of properly, and that the areas are now ready for reconstruction. As part of our closeout paperwork, we provide waste uh, manifest to show that the material ended up at a landfill and not behind some Publix or some daycare center where they found a, an open dumpster. I'm not kidding. It happens. Uh, we've seen some strange stuff in, in, in our world and it's always a head shaker. But yes, there are people out there that do improperly remove asbestos. But with a proper um, consulting firm identifying the asbestos, good teamwork, proper planning, proper abatement, proper documentation, the liability is, is significantly, if not completely reduced. So proper removal, 
proper documentation. And again, please keep that documentation with you at all times. Um, it's there, it's yours forever. Um, we actually have to keep our documentation for 30 years. Why? Because of that latency period. So you could call us up for a project we did 15 years ago and we'll have the documentation to say that's exactly what we did. And I do get those phone calls from time to time. So again, when it's, when it's gone, there's nothing there. And we actually write a letter saying it's gone, please continue. What do you do should you encounter a suspected asbestos materials? Don't touch it, leave it alone. Um, talk to somebody in a higher pay grade than you. Hey, we are now aware that this building may contain asbestos. You know, you know, you know, we all know. Since we're not impacting it, let's leave it alone. But should we do impact it through renovation or, or demolition or improvements? At least we know what we got and where it's at. Should it be disturbed accidentally, keep it wet, keep it covered. I know we see this often in our, our water restoration side where ceiling tiles will fall from a building or sheetrock is saturated and uh, flood cuts have to be uh, performed in it or another contractor may have came in and uh, got to the work before us before they were thrown off the job site. Well, we have to identify that those materials contain asbestos. So we keep it wet, we cover it, we protect it until we know what's to be done next. And if you don't know if your building has asbestos, have it tested. It would really, really be ideal if you could have it tested before the emergency rather than afterwards, because that's a delay and which translates to cost. And there's nothing worse going to your association and asking for that special assessment. Uh, we are special, but we don't wanna be that special. Um, and that's definitely a conversation we don't uh, enjoy being a part of when there's board members all screaming at each other and asking for money and why didn't we know. So again, the importance of having your facility tested beforehand. Um, we can offer you a, uh, referrals to people who perform the testing who are more well qualified and give you a better direction as to how much testing you need, where should you know, uh, or where should you know materials could be found. Um, there's common areas, I mean, they may not be necessary to test every single component of your facility, but there's commonly interacted materials that would be a good idea to know or not know. So again, we could be glad to direct you into the area of testing of professionals who perform that. Um, if an asbestos contractor, and it's been known to happen, if they say, I'll take a sample and I'll submit it to a lab for you, not advisable, not recommended, and actually illegal. Um, as you can see, we do have access to asbestos materials and we do remove a lot of it. Um, we're not that type of contractor. We do have ethics and we do take pride in doing things right, but a contractor can very easily taint that sample. So uh, the government has set it up that the Fox does not watch the hen house. Two independent parties do their own respective trades. Let the testing company test the asbestos. We have no dog in this fight. If it's negative, we really don't care, but we want somebody else to tell us whether that material contains asbestos or not. Any questions? That was great stuff. And I love what you mentioned at the end because there is a perception out there that a company that does what you do, if you go out and do the testing, oh my God, how are they gonna trust that you're telling the truth? So that is fantastic information. Uh, thanks for pointing that out as well. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, take a question. Am I still sharing my screen? Cause I can't see that. You are still sharing your screen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just hit, if you hit stop share, you should be good to go there. Yeah, and, uh, I'm all goofy footed over here. All right, I need to. I'm oh, do share, stop share. There you go. Stop share. There you go. And uh, I see uh, Monica is back on as well. And if you want to go through Monica, there's only a few questions on there. Um, you want to uh, take it from there and uh, present some of the questions to Robert. Sure, thank you, Jeff. Uh, well, Robert, we have some great questions here for you. First one, is there a minimal level of asbestos that is allowed? Good question. Um, that's a diverging question. The, as I mentioned, there's a, a, an alphabet soup of entities that govern things. If it's greater than 1%, it is considered an asbestos containing material, which by law requires a licensed contractor to perform the removal of that material. 
However, if it's less than 1%, it's, it's still viewed as an asbestos containing material, but OSHA laws go into effect. So say for example, you have a drywall material that contains 0.75% asbestos, not quite 1%. Most owners will, or, or facility people say, you know what, even though it's less than 1%, we want you to abate it. But legally, that contractor, if he abides by the OSHA rules and has a two hour training on how to deal with asbestos, just as a simple course, trained course, and uses appropriate respiratory protection, they can remove asbestos. And believe it or not, they can actually put it in a regular trash dumpster. Huh. It, but that's why it's advisable to speak to a professional because we understand the split hairs on how things are to be done. And sometimes it gets a little overwhelming, a little complicated for owners. And that's why they say, listen, I don't want to get involved in that whole, yeah, he may can do it and possibly and not get in trouble. If we give it to you, then, you know, faces are covered. Thank you, Robert. I have the next question. I'm not sure if it's um, completely related to the subject, but it says, how do you feel about pipelining pipes? Ah, you're right, Monica. That's a, a different field and a different trade. I don't know if this will answer this particular question, um, but pipelining can go into two directives. One, if you have an asbestos pipe, you can actually wrap it and cover it. So that, in my world, that could be viewed as a pipelining. Then there's another one with the technology that I just heard about recently. And when we saw those slides of the asbestos water lines that were running underneath uh, uh, that provide the water to South Florida, this individual developed a machine that will core through the asbestos pipe, the internal diameter of it, chomp up the asbestos materials, put it on a conveyor, bring it out, and able to install a new pipe in its place, um, which is something I have yet to see, but uh, it intrigues me, it fascinates me. I'd love to see how that works. But I would think that it's a more costly endeavor to try to work with the material underground or what you have than to just take it out, lay all new pipe. And again, what we find is just like with the asbestos floor tile, yes, you can enclose it, uh, you could put a new layer of asbestos, non-asbestos material over it to enclose it. But then that starts going into a warranty type thing. Is your contractor going to warranty this material? You're still leaving the asbestos there. It was never, it may not have been designed to, to repipe uh, uh, a pipelining. So there could be warranty issues that could go involved with it. And again, it is the most expensive option, but it is the one that gets everything back to scratch. And that's just remove the material. If it's gone, then you never have to deal with it again. Thank you, Robert. I have another great question. For anyone who has moved into a home or unit that was pre-1985 and the popcorn was previously removed without remediation, what are the post-health ramifications? Man, these people are good. They are good. <laughs> Man, these are challenging, challenging questions. Um, the brutal reality of it is, um, I don't know what the health concerns are. I don't. Um, and, and it is something that is common. Just uh, a few days ago, I was in my own neighborhood of Hollywood Hills, and I saw uh, a truck there that was popcorn removal. And we drove by and, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're removing the popcorn ceiling. And I asked him if he knew that it contained asbestos. And you, you know, you kind of get that dog cockeyed ear look. What are you talking about asbestos? So, and so the education begins. Um, but at that point, once it's done, and it's over with, <clears throat> and I hope that you all never have to repeat this again, but dilution is the solution to pollution. Um, you know, you, you say, say that fast, say that fast three times. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> you got me, man. <laughs> I'll say it just one more time. Dilution is the solution to pollution. And whereas asbestos fibers can become airborne, if you ventilate the area, you minimize the exposure. <laughs> Um, if you wipe down a facility using uh, uh, moist rags, uh, that'll definitely in, uh, uh, minimize more exposure. But unless, and this is really, really tricky and kind of a, a sad thing, but it's the world we live in. Unless you are actually caught in the act of removing asbestos, the county will not go back to assess damages. What can you do? 
Hmm. Unfortunately, I'm going to relate it to a very, very tragic event that just happened recently in Colorado. Um, it could have been prevented, but it's after the fact. What are you going to do now? Um, you know, hopefully set, set new precedences in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just one of those things where sometimes either homeowners elect to do it themselves with a little bit of training. Again, now you're going into that below 1% range. So we may recommend, hey, listen, if you're a concerned homeowner and you want to tackle it yourself, you legally can. As a homeowner, well, another good point. If you, are, if you own, uh, not a condo, not a condo, but if you own a residential home and you have popcorn ceiling in your house, you could legally remove it yourself as a homeowner. You just cannot hire anybody and you can actually throw it outside in the trash. Now, don't run with that answer and everybody start removing your old, own popcorn ceilings uh, willy nilly. But in that instance, I do tell homeowners, listen, you know what? I can recommend this respirator. I can recommend to you cleaning techniques. I can recommend installing a, a HEPA filtration device. That'll give you a sense of comfort uh, because you're actually doing something to mitigate it. Or you can hire a professional. We'll go in there and get it done and you'll get a piece of paper saying, hey, listen, it was done properly. And I would even go as far as after a cleaning to offer a greater, greater peace of mind, uh, have post remediation air testing performed because if the air is clean, then it's a reoccupied facility. Thank you, Robert. Next one, it's more of a statement, but I don't know if you want to comment on it. It says once, re once removed, it is bagged up and must be disposed by companies who specialize in the process. So it's more of a statement. I don't know if you want to want to comment on it. No comment. No, it, <laughs> it actually is what it is. Yes. Once it's done, it's, it's the documentation is there and uh, the, the project is complete. And, um, you know, I know you guys probably don't want to hear this, but you won't see me again unless there's another event. Um, what and done. And yes. Before, uh, before you get to the next question, Monica, that somebody had a follow-up to the respirator that Robert, you mentioned earlier, uh, the question was, what is the, what is the specific respirator you referred to please uh, from Heidi? Do not use this. And N95, do not use that either. Those actually aren't designed for this type of materials. Without getting too technical, an N95 respirator stops 95% of all particles 0.3 microns in diameter. The appropriate respirator to use at a minimum is a half face respirator with HEPA cartridges. And a HEPA cartridge will stop 99.97% of all particles 0.3 microns in diameter. And keep in mind, these, fil these filters were originally designed for clean rooms um, during the in space uh, uh, manufacturing or uh, uh, satellite manufacturing or, or things we send up high in the sky. Really? Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. To this day, uh, NASA uses them all over the place. Huh. Uh, hospitals will use them in their clean rooms, um, the HEPA filters. So it has to, the bare basic minimum is a half face respirator with HEPA cartridges. If it doesn't say that, you're only endangering yourself. Now, there is one more little caveat I want to add to that because this is a great question. People go to Home Depot and buy those half face respirators uh, all the time. And unfortunately, people don't read labels of things. And on the label, if you read it, it will say, please seek medical advice before wearing that respirator. Because just because it fits and you can wear it doesn't necessarily mean your body has the capability of using a restricted breathing device. And our technicians actually annually have to have uh, a medical surveillance to ensure that they can wear those respirators because it is labored breathing. You're in a work hot work environment for eight hours a day, um, you know, sweating and slipping all over your face. If there's a weight gain of more than 10 pounds, they actually have to have it refit tested to make sure that it's fitting properly. You can't, Jeff, you couldn't wear a respirator because you have speckly things all over you. <laughs> so you would actually have to be clean shaven. Um, John, you could wear one. Terry, you could wear one. And Monica, I've seen you wear a few in my day. Um, so yeah, yes. I couldn't play for the I couldn't play for the Yankees either. They make you shave your facial hair. So, well, today I learned something new. <laughs> um, so yes, and if you can wear those type of respirators, uh, but it would be advisable to educate yourself a little bit more on it. Um, if it's a small, minor thing, you know, and 
please make your own best decision, but at a minimum, it would need to be a half face respirator with HEPA cartridges. Thank you, Robert. This was actually Heidi's original question, and I think you answered it already, but I don't want to ignore it, so I'm just going to read through it. Can an individual condo owner or HOA homeowner remove their own old popcorn or linoleum tile, providing they do it correctly with or without testing? I think just that you just answered that. No, but I'm going to elaborate. No. Okay. Cannot. Great. <laughs> if the law is very clear that there's, there's, there's a significant difference between single family homes and multi-story facilities, multi-unit facilities. And if I'm going to do a residential home, it's a different requirement. But if you do anything with four or more units, you legally cannot do it. You must by law hire a licensed asbestos contractor. So whether you know it, again, going back to the, the, the point of testing, you need to know before you remove it, because if you remove it thinking it doesn't have asbestos, well, not only are you endangering yourself from a health factor and those around you, but you're also creating a violation and improperly removing it and properly disposing of it. And again, affecting those around you. So I would strongly recommend, if not strongly emphasize, if you are in a multi-unit uh, uh, facility, don't do it. Thank you, Robert. Uh, have again, but one. We have another one here. What about skimming a popcorn ceiling? And I tell you what, I've, I've done my share of classes and this is probably the one that has asked the most poignant and intelligent question. So whoever signed these people up is doing a fantastic job. This is a good group of people. Um, you actually can't uh, skim over it. However, you're disturbing the asbestos materials. And there may be some trades that say we can do it and we won't involve in it. Um, I'm sure the county would, would differ in, in, in their opinion as to who is qualified to do it. And I'll take it one step farther. When it does come to that encapsulation, sometimes uh, on popcorn ceiling textures, uh, rather than removing it, or rather than putting in some sort of enclosure, they will paint it, which is legally accepted. Um, but what needs to be taken into consideration is, um, can a painting company do it? Yes, providing they don't disturb the material and providing they're aware that the added weight of the paint is not gonna delaminate the asbestos materials from falling. But skimming is, is an actual touching, impacting, disturbing. Um, that is a very, very slippery slope. And you know it's ultimately the building owner's decision. Um, you know, we don't generally do that for a living, but if you're going to go that far, you might as well just remove it and start from scratch. Um, again, it's just, it's removing the hazard, but if, if they're not qualified and they don't have the proper education and use the right tools, yes, and I'm sure a, a skimming contractor can do it, but they have to be in compliance with these rules and regulations because if they're not, the liability falls right back on the person who retained their services. Thank you, Robert. And we have one last great question. It says, is this usually covered by homeowner's insurance? The asbestos abatement? The short answer, no. There was a time, uh, I'm probably going back maybe eight, 10 years, where they it was part of the services. And every blue moon, I do come across it. Uh, just recently um, in Fort Lauderdale, there was a... Uh, restoration contractor who does not perform asbestos removal, um, removed drywall uh, sheetrock in, in, in a bathroom from a leaky pipe above. They had the wherewithal to stop really quickly and say, does this have asbestos? That material was tested and came back positive for asbestos. Fortunately, and for whatever reason, the insurance company is actually paying for the asbestos removal. Now, I'm not an insurance agent. I don't know how policies are written. Sometimes they're slipped in. Sometimes people haven't realized that they're there. But for the most part, most insurance companies have kind of wisened up and said, we didn't put it there. We don't want to insure for something we did not know that was there. So I'm not surprised to see clauses that exclude it. Um, but I'm sure there's people that are more qualified than I am. And what's terrible is like after a hurricane or during a hurricane, that's when people want to read their policies and then find out what's covered and what's not. Mm -hmm. It's kind of prudent just to take the time out and read those to see whether you are or not covered. So 
it, I don't see it that often, Monica, but it does happen, but it's becoming exceedingly rare. So read your policy. Thank you very much, Robert. That's all we have for questions. So Jeff, back to you. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for handling those questions there, Monica. Wonderful as usual. Um, before we uh, uh, leave you today, can somebody from our uh, outstanding water restoration team please recite how you can be reached and the website address, even though it'll be on the evaluations, uh, how, what's the best way to reach y'all? The best way is calling our office number. Uh, we have a 24 seven um, number where we're available. It's 305-661-2533. Uh, or we can be reached through our website or the TSK website as well. So we're here to answer any questions you need. Uh, please give us a call, email us, and uh, you know we'll for sure get back to you to answer any questions you all have. We appreciate that. And this session has been recorded and will be on the TSK website in a few days. Uh, in addition, for those of you on the phone, we realize when we leave, you will not see the evaluation link as somebody pointed out in the, in the chat earlier. So, uh, but we have that covered as well. We place the evaluation link in the chat window uh, for those of you who wanna do that now. But for those of you on the phone, tomorrow at about this time, maybe about an hour before this time, you'll receive an, a, a follow-up email. All attendees will receive a follow-up email thanking you for attending. But it will also have the link for the evaluation if you haven't already done so. And it will also have the link to download the course materials that Robert shared today if you wish to retain those as well. Um, so with that in mind, I'm out of material. I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Terry unless we have any final parting words from Robert, John, or Monica. I do. And I, 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 I'm actually impressed with the, with the technical questions that came in. And I, I appreciate when people don't have a fear to ask things that they really don't know about. And, you know, again, we're really here to assist. We're, you know, it's about just getting the word out there so that you're knowledgeable. And knowledge is something you can take with you anywhere. So please, I, I implore you not to be afraid to ask questions. There's really no such thing as a dub question. And I'm so passionate about it. And I enjoy I know I'm an oddball that I love my career. I really enjoy doing what I do. And to speak to people with, with comfort and kindness and at an educating way that they can understand, it is truly our pleasure. So no question too difficult, too rough. We're here to assist. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you again. I, we, we appreciate all the questions and uh, you know we don't charge for answering questions. So please know we're here to answer anything you need and not only related to asbestos, but if it's related to a water loss, you know, mold, fire, rebuilds, we're here to thank you, everyone. Terry? Oh, well, thank you. This was great. And I've heard Robert in person and uh, down in Gallupies, you get John, who's down there being really quiet this morning, but he's not really quiet in the live uh, active breakfast in the morning. And I just want to remind everybody that May 5th will be back in um, these people are great. They've been with us for a long time and uh, they participate and uh, they're always happy to answer questions. And um, we really uh, are happy to have them on the website. There's a lot of information about the company on the website. So go on, read about them and answers. You can find a lot of that on the website too, Robert. And this whole presentation what I find is I've heard Robert a couple of times and now new things stick out that I don't remember hearing before, Robert. Huh. So I don't know if you've changed information, added new information, but some of it's been very eye-opening and I've had a popcorn ceiling removed and I didn't realize how much danger I was in with that popcorn ceiling. So uh, <laughs> we'll call about that. Um, but thanks again, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this and uh, Check out our live events on the website and uh, we'll see everybody in our next webinar. Thanks. All right. Thanks everybody. Stay safe out there. See you next time. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.